All right, so our next speaker is Match Butcher from the Deus team. Um, a fun fact about Deus, this is probably the 50th time they've rebased Deus on top of something. Um, <laughs> but I totally think Kubernetes is going to stick. So with that, let's do a big round of applause for rebasing onto Kubernetes. We, we don't count those first 49 times at all. Yeah, this is only our second version. No, really. Uh, yeah, I'm Matt Butcher. Uh, I'm the architect on the Deus project. Um, let me give you a quick introduction to Deus. Then I'm going to go from there and tell you about this idea we had to rebase onto Kubernetes and how we've started going about doing it and what we're learning from that. And then I'm going to give you kind of five quick lessons that we're in the process of learning as we do this crazy thing. So Deus, really, if I had to describe it in two words, I would say it's a containerized PaaS. We bought into the, uh, the kind of Docker idea that we should be running these components inside of containers, but we wanted to build a platform as a service kind of thing. So here's the vision, right? Uh, application developers like things like Heroku. How many of you have ever used Heroku to deploy an application, even if it's just like a sample one? Yeah, that does not surprise me. I've done it myself many times. What's great about Heroku is that it's so easy to use, right? As the developer, you do your source code, you get push it in there, and magically you've got instances running there, and you can scale them up, you can see the logs, it's great. From the developer standpoint, it was an easy workflow, and we liked that. But what we didn't like about it was that you would get stuck running everything inside of Heroku. So when you wanted to deploy on your own bare metal, not really an option. You wanted to use AWS, not really an option. And so what we tried to do was build a platform that from the developer side was as easy to use as Heroku, but could run on your own infrastructure. So a DevOps team could take it and deploy it into AWS or Azure or DigitalOcean or on their own bare metal or whatever. And they made the choices and they picked the features they wanted and they could pick which of the backend services they wanted to use. That was sort of the ideal uh, or the idea behind Deus V1. And in practice, it kind of came out like this. Right, so we started with the operating system. We said we're going to start with core OS. Uh, it's a great operating system for what we want to do. Inside of that, we're going to run Fleet and etcd. Those are the two big components that we decided not to really run in Docker. We actually have experimented several times with running them as Docker containers, but we always keep going back to running them outside. And then we're going to take Docker, and we're going to run a bunch of things inside of Docker containers. So this green, all these green boxes are the you know, sort of like the overview of the components in Deus v1, a little bit simplified. So there's a controller which has the API surface, and uh, you know it, it has a database that keeps track of what's getting deployed and when. Uh, we've got a router mesh based on Nginx that routes traffic into the cluster, a Docker registry, some logging tools, um, a storage backend, Ceph is what we chose to do for that. And then we had this thing called the builder. And the builder is really the Heroku-ish part, right? It has a git receive on it, right? So you push your uh, project into the, into the git repo there, and it takes the source code, and it runs it through the Heroku build system. It builds a slug, rolls that into a Docker uh, container, pushes the image into the registry, and then notifies controller, and controller goes and deploys it, right? So it's a big bundle of stuff all packed into that one little box there. And then, of course, what happens when you run things through this is you generate those little purple boxes on the side, right? Little containers that are running the apps that you built with Heroku. This was Deus v1. And we liked it. Uh, we decided we wanted to try and increase some of the flexibility. And one of the places we identified where we could increase configurability was the scheduler. And uh, you know, Fleet was doing an OK job. We wanted to try some other things and see if we could schedule using Swarm. Then we tried Mesos and Marathon. Then we tried Kubernetes. And we were going, look, we can, we can handle all the different schedulers. Let's just handle them all. But as we started down that path seriously in earnest and went from preview release to trying to plan how we'd actually do this, what we realized is that instead of, instead of supporting a whole bunch of different schedulers, we were, we were starting to support like the, the bottom of the barrel scheduler. right? Because we needed a common interface. And we needed to be able to treat all these things as basically the same. And what that meant was we had to take the weaknesses, or the weakest parts of each scheduler and treat those as sort of the across the board feature set. So we were building a obviously less than ideal scheduler. That was a tough moment for us. Uh, we, had, we had this idea of componentizing and it turns out that wasn't the right place to try and make things swappable. So we sat down with the things we really wanted to get out of a scheduler. 
and even more so, things we wanted to get out of a container platform. And we started talking about you know, volume management and, um, and being able to store secrets somewhere and service discovery. And we very quickly narrowed and narrowed and narrowed down to what we thought was our best choice, which is Kubernetes, because it really, the vision that Kubernetes has is very similar to the way we see the world. Um, Mesos was, was kind of very close there, and we realized that, well, we can run Kubernetes inside of Mesos, so, you know, we get a free one there. And so we started re-architecting this platform around Kubernetes. And this is the way it's starting to look now. So let's start in the middle with Kubernetes. There's something that should strike many of you who work on Kubernetes about this, right? Why is there only one box for Kubernetes? Uh, that's because we are, the, our view of this has changed. Uh, we now view this whole tier as one thing that we don't have to worry about. Kubernetes will just handle all of this stuff for us. And the first simplification it made is that we don't have to worry about that bottom blue box anymore. You know, we were, we were very devoted to CoreOS. We, we love CoreOS, but now we don't need to uh, voice that opinion on you. So my dev, uh, my dev environment is running a Fedora-based one. My two colleagues who sit on my left are both running CoreOS-based ones, and the one who sits on my right is running in GKE, and I don't think really cares at all what actual distribution of Linux is running under there. And all of us are productive, and we don't have a lot of cases where we don't have any cases where we say, oh, well, the reason yours is doing that and mine is doing this is because I'm on Fedora and you're on CoreOS. Uh, so, so Kubernetes has basically allowed us to stop really caring about the blue box at the bottom. And we treat Kubernetes as one big thing. So we stop worrying about the Docker inside of it and all of those sorts of things. We just try and track Kubernetes. Now, another tough lesson we learned, which is manifest there in the increase in number of green boxes, is that we had been telling ourself, ourselves a little lie. And the lie went something like this. Uh, all y'all all should be using microservices and 12-factor apps. And, and here's how you guys should be doing it. And we're building this little componentized system too. But the truth of the matter was our componentized version of Deus, you know, this one right here, wasn't as componenty as we wanted to believe it was. It was actually everything was very tightly coupled together. And we couldn't really conveniently take things out and swap other things in. And here, here's a great example of that. A, a user said, well, I, I like your builder thing, but I don't necessarily want to build my code there. I just want to run Heroku-style slugs inside of it. And we said, well, you can't really do that. I mean, there's, it's a build pipeline. You push the code. Yeah, I understand it. No, you push the code in, and we build stuff for you. That's the way it works, OK? Uh, we we sort of swallowed our pride and readjusted when we started looking at the way Kubernetes deals with things and listening to what our users were asking. And we said, all right maybe we should really try and build this as a whole bunch of separable workloads that we can orchestrate together and build Deus on top of, but that people can use individual components on their own. And so we took apart the builder as an experiment in doing this, and we broke off the Git gateway and the slug builder part that builds the Heroku style slug and the slug runner part that runs the Heroku slug. And we started experimenting with running each of these in isolation. And so today, you can head over to Deus, uh, github slash deus slash slug runner and get just the slug runner piece. So if you just want to run Heroku style slugs, we can do it now. And we rely on Kubernetes to do a lot of the, the wiring up of components for us. And then we can actually swallow our pride and do the microservices thing the right way. We've been doing the same thing with etcd, with Postgres. And if you head out and start looking at how we've been re-architecting things, we've basically broken down our mono repo into a whole bunch of smaller projects, basically with this kind of goal and intent in mind. Okay, So we're really excited about the way things are going. Uh, but we're learning some other lessons, and some of them are not easy lessons to learn. <laughs> so uh, let's go through five of them, starting with number five. Uh, turtles all the way down. Security is hard. Docker security, when you're building Docker images, which is one of the things we do in the slug builder, is uh, dangerous. Okay? And one of the things we decided we did not want to do was force an entire Kubernetes cluster into privileged mode and doing things less than perfectly securely because we wanted to build containers inside of it. And we followed all of the big long threads on, on uh, the Kubernetes issue queue. And then we decided, hey, we've got this crazy, crazy idea, and we think it's going to work. So here's what we did. We started with a container. Inside the container, we, we put Kimu in full-on emulation mode. Inside of that, we ran Linux. Inside of that, we ran Docker. 
Inside of that, we started running our image builder. So now we can build an image. We can have the Docker inside of Kimu running you know, as insecurely as it wants and, and trust Kimu to be our isolation layer uh, to prevent any weird security stuff. So a fun fact, if you should happen to go to images.google or something or Flickr, it's really hard to find a deeper stack than four turtles. I, I really wanted one with like eight turtles stacked. Of but what you're actually asking, instead of turtle, did it work? OK, honesty time. Turns out that with you know, your typical like Go kind of project, switching over and doing all the build inside of this Kimu environment, inside of a Docker environment, with, you know, adds about 10 to 15% overhead. And we thought to ourselves, yes, our users will swallow that, no problem, right? Getting the I.O. down, though, has been way worse. And uh, in some of our builds, we've seen the I.O. time go from a couple of minutes to up to 40. And that was not acceptable. So here we are, you know, three quarters of the way down this path, still excited about the idea, but we're still trying to work through some of this. So we will let you know uh, where the last turtle is. All right, number four, the Bartleby effect. How many of you were forced to read Bartleby the Scrivener by, um, was it Melville? Uh, okay. No, there you go. Um, all right, so Kubernetes uses manifest files, right, to describe all of your pods and your uh, services and your volumes and so on. We struggled as an as a application-focused engineering team building this platform to really get grounded in this. Uh, the example, all the material we had collectively for how to write manifests came down to two things, examples in the Kubernetes documentation, which were pedagogical, but not necessarily reflective of how you'd run in production. And then the pieces of Kubernetes, which were more about how to run Kubernetes with pieces of Kubernetes. Uh, we, we ran into tutorials that were broken. We ran into examples that didn't quite work the right way. And we couldn't find many tools for building these kinds of things. And a couple of our engineers were getting very, very frustrated. And here's the Bartleby quote, right? They're sitting there writing these manifests over and over again going, I would really prefer not to be doing this. We also noticed that people were encountering sort of a steep learning curve just to get things running in Kubernetes. So even if we started them off with GKE, it still took more time than we felt was necessary before they could get running. So we ended up with two big problems. Number one, our team was not collecting around building manifests the way we wanted them to. We didn't have any best practices. We didn't have a place to store these things, and we didn't feel like we were effectively building them. Number two, it was a formidable challenge for new users. And we realized that both of those problems were not our team's problems. They were sort of the Kubernetes community's problems. And so we decided to try and build a tool that could do this for us. So we thought about it a lot. And we said, what would the ideal tool look like? Well, to us, it kind of looks like Homebrew, right? We love the way that Homebrew or apt-get or yum or something, you type in a command and say, I want to install this thing, and it installs something. Now, we recognize the use case is a little more complicated, and we accommodated some of those things. But that basic feel is really what we were after. And so we created this tool called Helm, which is basically a package manager for Kubernetes. And it reads charts, which are pre-packaged definitions of how you can start something up inside of Kubernetes. And then today, we've decided we're going to release that out there. So the 0.1, this thing is seriously like three weeks old. The 0.1 release is out there today. We would love for you guys to head to like helm.sh and take a look at this, give us some feedback, maybe even contribute some charts. Because what we really want to do is solve problems for teams and ease the on-ramp into Kubernetes. All right, we're done. We're done. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so one of the other things that we realized as we were building this out is that uh, we often needed a place for mutable storage. We used environment variables a lot. We used secrets way more than anybody should be using secrets. Uh, we used uh, you know, the, the uh, service discovery very effectively. But there were still a lot of times when what we needed was two components to be able to write somewhere shared. And, and basically what we wanted was we wanted our etcd back. etcd is like our little security blanket. And we love it. And it does exactly what we wanted to be able to do. But Tinkering with Kubernetes etcd is a big no-no, right? We don't want to start putting stuff in there. So we needed to figure out how to run etcd inside of Kubernetes and run a robust cluster of etcd inside of Kubernetes. 
And so we basically began the process of relearning exactly how we were supposed to build things. Remember the previous, way back in the version one slide, right? We were running etcd right on top of CoreOS outside of Docker. And we'd tried it before in Docker and not had a lot of luck. But we knew this time we had some new tools to use with Kubernetes that would help us do it the right way. And so we relearned how to build services inside of Kubernetes. And we did it basically like this. We stand up a discovery uh, etcd pod inside of Kubernetes. And then we uh, spin up some replication controllers and they, with etcd instances, and they uh, contact that discovery service and they all stand themselves up. And uh, then we hit some of the really difficult challenges. And that led us to what I call the Chumba Wumba principle. Or if you'd like to have a song stuck in your head for the rest of the day, I get knocked down and I get up again. So here was the problem. There's a lot of stuff you have to do to make images work the way that really takes advantage of the heart of Kubernetes, right? And the Docker images that we were finding at Docker Hub or Quay or GCR, these things were all what I would call solipsistic, right? Solipsism is the philosophy of being completely isolated and alone, right? Docker images were built with only themselves in mind. But to get what we wanted out of Kubernetes, we needed Docker images that were built with the cluster in mind and with the ability to work with other ones in mind. And so we decided we're not just going to do plain Docker images. We're going to spend some time very seriously investing in the bootstrapping process and the environmental control of any of these particular things. etcd is a great example. Our Postgres HA is another good example. So we start by doing a custom bootstrap. And inside of this, every time something starts, we've got a piece of, we, we actually write our bootstrap now in Go instead of Shell uh, for, the error, and for the good error control you get there. So during boot up, it might, uh, for etcd, it, it will actually try and connect to the API server in Kubernetes and get a little bit of information there. It'll connect to the downward API and figure out information about its environment. And, it'll, and we provide all of that stuff in these bootstrapping scripts so that by the time, sometimes we even generate the config files right there and then, so that by the time the service comes up, it's a service that comes up tuned to the Kubernetes environment. Now the big issue is, everybody repeat after me, pods or cattle, right? So they're gonna die. And we needed a way to recover. And we realized that actually one of the better ways to recover was on startup. So for example, when a node falls out of the etcd cluster, when the replication controller starts its replacement, the first thing it does is it takes a look at the health of the etcd cluster. And it asks the Kubernetes API, what do you think is running? And it asks the etcd, uh, uh, the other nodes in the etcd cluster, what do you guys think is running? And then it tries to reconcile the two. And so we don't have master election lockups and, and things like that, that if you've worked with any of those sort of things that do master election, you know you can get into some hairy situations there. So that's how we've sort of gotten past a lot of those issues with bootstrapping, with self-healing, and things like that. All right, the last one. Um, the service is part of the consumer. So mentally, when we went into building these services, this is the sort of model we had. And I'll take a, a really like canonical case, right? Imagine you've got a WordPress site. So you've got your My App WordPress site, and you've got a database somewhere else, MySQL database, right? Now, <clears throat> the WordPress site needs to be able to connect to the database. And so we often describe it like this. Well, the database, we've got some pods back here, and we've got this service that front ends the database, and we connect the WordPress by service discovering this particular service. Now imagine a slightly more complicated. I've got my app and I've got your app. Both of us are using MySQL databases in the back end. Both of them have services to connect to. But now we have a little naming issue. You see, because the service discovery requires code that's sitting inside of the image, it means that prior to ever deploying this stuff into Kubernetes, we need to know a whole lot about the environment. And so uh, we can't just say, mine connects to MySQL, yours connects to MySQL, and go service discovering MySQL, because what if we're running two separate databases? So we, you know, typically, we'd have to actually rebuild our images to point to the right service. So we've flipped things around a little bit and said, all right, let's say that the service definition belongs to the app. 
So when the, in, you know, in the final stages of app, so the app developer knows ahead of time, I'm going to call my database service, my app, my SQL, right? And you call yours, your app, my SQL. Ooh, that sounds weird. Uh, you write up the service definitions, you include those as part of this kind of app configuration. And then the database in the background is only responsible for fulfilling whatever the, the, the query labels are on the DB service. So then when we have to make changes, uh, instead of having to modify the code running in the container, we're just modifying the service's query or maybe the labels that are attached to the database. So an example of this, you can head over to the Helm repo and take a look at the example to do app. So the example to do app has its code, and then it declares a service that is uh, you know, to do underscore Redis or something like that. And it's fulfilled by a Redis backend. Now, if you look in the Helm repo, you'll notice that there is both a Redis standalone chart and a Redis cluster chart. One stands up one individual Redis, the other starts up a full cluster. Either of those will fulfill the service contract that's set on the first one, on the, on the example to do app. And so we don't have to manage tweaking the service definitions and the service discovery in the app. We just handle it all with label selectors and queries. So those are some of the lessons that we're learning so far. Uh, we're interested in best practices. We're trying to figure out what the best way is to build on top of Kubernetes. You know, like remember, our red box there is Kubernetes. We're not so much interested in the internals. We're interested in how we build apps on top of it. We're interested in that that ideal I talked about, right, of being a PaaS that makes it so easy for developers to use, to be a platform that makes it so easy to, for developers to use. That's part of the reason we built Helm, because as part of the community, we're going, what we really feel strongly about is that we start figuring out good ways to do labeling, good ways to use annotations, uh, good ways to build sort of standard uh, pod manifests that other people can look at and learn from and adapt and teach us back. So that's where we're going. Thank you guys very much. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions or not, but I'll hang around here and I'll be around here for the conference. Thanks.